Hello, my friends. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. Today, I'm talking about placenta previa, painless placenta previa, painless placenta previa. Say that 10 times fast. It's not easy to do. There is a difference between abruptio placenta, which I have already done, and painless placenta previa. So let's get started. Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the home of the very best NCLEX review in the entire universe. You can go to clinicreviews.com and you can get access to our online on-demand NCLEX review. You can also find there our small group tutoring and our streaming service. So let's go ahead and talk about placenta previa. This is in the blue book. You can get the blue book on Amazon or you go to clinicreviews.com and you can get it as an app. All right, where do I want to start? We talked about abruptio placenta already. Abruptio placenta is where there is a separation of the placenta from the uterine wall somewhere uh, um, within the uterus and it can cause a lot of pain. The key thing with abruptio placenta is it causes pain. Uh, and some bleeding. But with placenta previa, you actually have, for some reason, the placenta doesn't grow correctly. And it actually covers the part where it's supposed to be attached to the uterus, actually covers the cervix or the cervical area or the birth canal area. And it causes a lot of bleeding, but it's painless because there's no separation occurring. It's this in abruptio placenta, it's the separation that causes the pain. There's no separation of placenta previa. It's just where the placenta started to grow. And so, and it's too low. And I'm going to show you a picture a little later. So let's go ahead and talk about placenta previa. And we'll start out by talking about just what it is. A pregnant client at 32 weeks gestation arrives at the ED reporting painless vaginal bleeding. Which condition does the nurse suspect? So what is it that leads us? Obviously, the answer is placenta previa, since that's what we're talking about today. But how can you remember that? Well, first of all, they're already pregnant, okay? They're already pregnant, and they're not having any pain. So we can cross off preterm later labor because they're not having any pain. If they were having contractions, we would say preterm lab labor. They're 32 weeks along, so we're going to rule out ectopic pregnancy because this would have been a problem a while ago. Ectopic pregnancies don't make it to term. They wouldn't have made it to 32 weeks. They would have had a lot of pain and problems before this, so we're going to rule out ectopic pregnancy. So we're left with between placenta previa and abruptio placenta, and we have painless vaginal bleeding. So that's how you differentiate placenta previa and abruptio placenta. When they come in and it's painless bleeding, you say that's placenta previa. So I just wanted to make sure that you could see what I'm talking about here. Wrong, wrong picture. There we go. So you can see here in normal placenta, you have the placenta wall growing out of the uterine wall high up where it's supposed to be. Then we have a marginal placenta previa, which is close to the cervix, but it's not quite there yet. And then partial where it's partially covering it and then total where it's totally covering it, okay? So that's what a placenta previa is. A client diagnosed with placenta previa is admitted to the hospital. Which interventions should the nurse implement? Select all that apply. Y'all, they're gonna be admitted to the hospital if they have bleeding, okay, bleeding. They may have to take them for C-section and take the baby early. If they can get them into the hospital and they can get their bleeding stopped, they can keep them, they'll keep them pregnant for as long as possible so that the baby can develop. But, you know, if they have to, they'll have to take that baby early because fetal demise is the problem if there's too much bleeding associated with it, right? If the mom hemorrhages out, the baby's gonna die and the mom's gonna die. So. Client diagnosed with placenta previa is admitted to the hospital. Which intervention should the nurse implement? So, so we're worried about mom. We're worried about baby. We're worried about bleeding. Monitor fetal heart rate continuously. Y'all, absolutely. We're worried about baby. We got to monitor baby continuously. Perform a vaginal examination to assess cervical dilation. All right. A vaginal examination is not something the nurse should be doing with placenta previa. The doctor can come in and do a speculum exam where they actually visualize what it looks like, but we're not doing any digital 
uh, vaginal exams because it could cause a lot of problems. So no, do not do B. Prepare for possible cesarean delivery. Yeah, this is a possibility. If it said prepare for cesarean delivery, I wouldn't pick it, but for possible cesarean delivery, see, I'm, I'm not the person who makes that call. So a possible one, absolutely, I need to be prepared for that. Administer corticosteroids as prescribed. Why would we do that? Corticosteroids mature baby's lungs. That's why I would do that. And I like this answer because it says administer as prescribed. So the, as opposed to like, I'm not going to question the order. So if I get an order to administer corticosteroids, I'm not questioning it because I know that's the medication we give to mature baby's lungs. And if we have to take this baby early, we need to give them corticosteroids. Encourage ambulation in the hallway. Absolutely not. This is bed rest for mom while we try to prevent her from bleeding and from possibly going into labor early. We want the baby to bake as long as possible so it can be mature. The nurse is teaching a client with placenta previa about her condition, which statement by the client indicates a need for further teaching. Further teaching means false statement. So further goes with false. So I'm looking for the false statement. So she has placenta previa. I'm looking for the statement that is false. I understand that I need to limit my physical activity. Absolutely true. I should report any increase in bleeding immediately. Absolutely true. I can expect to deliver my baby vaginally. False, y'all. Uh, placenta previa babies are delivered by C-section. I need to avoid sexual intercourse until after delivery. Absolutely true. So, and I think you understand why that is from what I explained to you about placenta previa and so forth and what it is. So hopefully you understand that answer. Which of the following complications is the most significant concern for a client with placenta previa? So most significant concern means most common and most life-threatening. So if none of the concerns are life-threatening, then you go with the most common. But if any of them are life-threatening, you go, is this likely to happen? And is it life-threatening? And I go, that's most, that's the one that's most significant. Infection, it can happen. Preeclampsia, I mean, it can happen, but it's not associated with placenta previa. Fetal anomalies, that could happen. Hemorrhage, okay, that's life-threatening. It definitely could happen. It's associated with placenta previa, so we're going to go ahead and pick that one. In caring for a client with placenta previa, which of the following is the highest priority nursing action? So the highest priority nursing action means best, best nursing action. Best nursing action is that one thing that you have to do you do not want to tell the National Council of State Boards of Nursing that you're not going to do this one thing because it's absolutely important in order to care for a patient with this problem. And this problem is placenta previa. Assess maternal vital signs every eight hours. I don't really want to tell the National Council I'm going to do it every eight hours because she's at very unstable. I'd rather do it every hour, every two hours. That's more like when I want to get vital signs. Monitor urinary output. Okay, I want to do that. That's fine. Um, ensure IV access is maintained. Absolutely. I want to do that, especially with a large bore IV needle, because if we have to give her blood, I need to have IV fluids there. Evaluate fetal heart rate patterns. Absolutely. I want to do that. So I do want to monitor urinary output, but that doesn't seem like the highest priority to me. A and B. So I'm going to rule out A and B. So I'm like, I have to have an IV access and I have to evaluate fetal heart rate patterns. So how am I going to choose between these two? And this is what people tell me all the time. I got down to two, Dr. Sharon. I couldn't figure it out. This is common with high, with high priority or best questions. So what I say is I'm going to make sure I have an IV line, but I'm not going to monitor fetal pat heart rate patterns. Well, that doesn't seem, I don't really want to tell the National Council of State Boards of Nursing I'm not going to monitor fetal heart patterns. I mean, what's a high risk? Fetal demise. Do I really want to tell the National Council I'm not going to monitor the baby or I'm going to monitor fetal patterns, but not make sure their IV access is maintained? So, y'all, I have to monitor fetal heart rate patterns. I have to do that. We can get an IV in later if we absolutely have to, but I cannot tell the National Council that I'm not going to monitor this baby's heart rate patterns when I know the fetal demise is such a high risk. Okay. So that's the correct answer. Now, when you get these priority questions or these best questions, high priority questions, there are going to be two answers and you like them both. And they're both important. Y'all, this is, this is a conceptual question. It is not a clinical question because in real life, we would make sure we did both C and D. 
on the test, what they're saying is which one shows that you understand what are the highest risks here? And we understand the highest risk is for fetal demise. And we, if we have to, we can put an IV in later. But I do not want to tell the National Council of State Boards of Nursing that I'm going to disregard fetal heart rate patterns. A nurse is caring for a client with suspected placenta previa. The client asked why a cesarean delivery might be necessary. What is the nurse's best response? So I'm looking for a true statement. And I'm looking for a true statement that is, if there's more than one true statement, I'm looking for the, the one that encompasses any other true statement there might be. A cesarean delivery reduces the risk, risk of infection. Well, I don't think that's true. Your may, baby might be in a breech position. I suppose it could be. The placenta is blocking the birth canal. That's absolutely true. You may develop a high blood pressure during labor. Could happen, but the one that I know for sure, uh, for someone with placenta previa, why they need C-section every time, no vaginal delivery for a placenta previa, is that the placenta is blocking the birth canal. Which client? Cooper. <laughs> My dog looked at me like, what, mom? I'm making lots of noise. Is that bothering you? Yes, Cooper, that's bothering me. Stop. <laughs> Cooper, stop. All right, he left the room. Good. Which client is at highest risk for developing placenta previa? All right, a 25-year-old prima gravida with a history of preeclampsia, a 30-year-old gravida 3 para 2 with previous cesarean deliveries, a 22-year-old woman with gestational diabetes, a 28-year-old woman carrying twins. So the number one risk for placenta previa is multiple deliveries, and uh, the second is cesarean deliveries. So we always pick, when it asks about risks, we always pick the person with the most risk factors. So really the only person who has risk factors is B. Which medication is commonly administered to promote fetal lung maturity in a client with preterm placenta previa? So I told you already, we use corticosteroids to mature fetal lungs. Betamethasone, y'all, if it ends in sone, prednisone, betamethasone, then it is a corticosteroid. Mag sulfate is used to stop preterm labor. Nifedipine is used to stop preterm labor. Oc <laughs> Cooper, stop. Oxytocin is used to start labor. So the only one that's used to mature lungs is betamethasone. A client at 36 weeks gestation with known placenta previa reports increased vaginal bleeding and uterine contractions. What is the nurse's priority action? So here we have someone who's 36 weeks gestation. 37 weeks is considered full term. So she's not full term yet. So she's in preterm labor because she's having uterine contractions and she has placenta previa. So my concern is that we're going to have to take the baby a week early. So what do I want to do? Well, let me just think about this. So what I want to do is I want to mature baby's lungs and I want to stop labor if we can. If we can't, we're going to take her for C-section. So those are my thoughts. So priority action, notify the healthcare provider. Well, I definitely want to do that. She's 36 weeks, she's bleeding and she's in preterm later. I definitely want to notify the healthcare provider. So that's going to stay on my list. Check the client's cervical dilation. No, I'm not going to do that because that's dangerous. Prepare for emergency cesarean delivery. Yes, I probably do want to do that. Administer tocolytic medications as prescribed. Tocolytic medications stop labor. All right, so I have really, honestly, three things here that I'm, I could do. Um, notify the healthcare provider is a priority for me because she's preterm labor and she needs to have a C-section if she's going to deliver. So that's, I'm keeping that on my list. Prepare for emergency delivery. Prepare for emergency delivery is not something I'm willing to do right now. If it said prepare for possible, well, let me, let me just say this. Prepare for emergency delivery is not my priority because she's preterm. And because I have the option to notify the healthcare provider, and I'd rather the healthcare provider has to decide whether they're going to take her for delivery preterm. And it doesn't say prepare for possible uh, C-section, and it's not a SATA. If it was a SATA, I would pick C, but I'm not comfortable with that being my priority because if I choose that, that means I'm not going to notify the healthcare provider. So I'm, I'm crossing C off. Administer tocolytic medications as prescribed. So I really like that because... That's something, if we can stop preterm labor, we need to do that. She's got, she's 36 weeks. She's not full term. We need to stop labor. So 
I'm between A and D. If it was a sad question, I'd be super happy, but it's not. I can, I have to do one. So I say, what is my top priority? Notify the healthcare provider immediately, but don't administer tocolytic medications, or I'm going to administer tocolytic medications as prescribed, but not notify the healthcare provider. Y'all, I have to notify the healthcare provider. I have to do it. Now, I had somebody uh, send me a message after I did some questions and the right answer was notify the healthcare provider. And they said, I didn't have any questions on the NCLEX where the option was to notify the healthcare provider. And I say, fine, you didn't happen to. There are questions where the option would be to notify the healthcare provider. You didn't happen to get any of them. Fine. Remember, the right answer is the right answer because of the other answers. Okay. The right answer is the right answer because of the other answers. If notify the healthcare provider wasn't there, I would have picked D because that stops labor and it says as prescribed, right? So I would stop labor, try to stop labor before I would prepare for a C-section. That's what I would do in a preterm person. If she was 37, 38, 39, 40, I would be preparing for C-section. I wouldn't be trying to stop labor. I'm trying to stop labor because she's 30 six weeks. So you have to pay attention to the words of the question. You have to pay attention to the other answers to decide what's your top priority. Which of the following signs would indicate that a client with placenta previa is experiencing hypovolemic shock? So low volume shock. Shock is when you're failing to perfuse your tissues. So what are some symptoms of failure to perfuse tissues? Well, your blood pressure goes down. You become pale. Your urine output goes down. You change the level of consciousness, your urine output goes down, and you become tachycardic because the heart is trying to compensate for low perfusion. So the, the, the body stimulates the heart rate to go up saying, hey, we got to get more blood out to the tissues. So those are the signs of hypovolemic shock. So hypertension and bradycardia, absolutely not. Those are the exact opposite of signs of shock. Tachycardia, yes, and hypotension, absolutely. Those are signs of shock. Decreased respiratory rate and warm skin, no. We have poor skin perfusion. You don't have warm skin. Poor tissue perfusion. You don't have warm skin. Increased your knuckle. These are all the opposite of what shock are. Every one of them, A, C, and D, are the opposite of what shock is. So make sure you know shock. I do have a video called pressure and perfusion and it's an older video. So, uh, it doesn't get as many views as, as it did when it first came out. Maybe I'll redo something like that. Maybe I'll redo a shock video so people will watch it. But if you really don't understand shock, watch the pressure and perfusion video, just type in pressure and perfusion clinic and it'll come up. <clears throat> That's it. So I hope that was helpful. Remember painless placenta previa, the risk is bleeding. Uh, there's a risk for shock. C-section is the treatment of choice if they can't stop labor or control the bleeding. And corticosteroids mature the lungs of the baby. So I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.